Yes, please. Shall we start? Yes, yes. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the International Conference on Global Trends in English Language, Literature and Linguistics 2022 edition. This conference is jointly organized by the efforts of Research and Culture Society, Department of English, Miller, University Center, Algeria, and International Scientific Research Association. And this conference is supported by School of Languages, Literature and Linguistics, EU and English Literature Club. So I would like to start off by presenting our speakers for the session. Mr. Uh, Dr. Mr. Naga Lakshmi from the Department of English at Vistas Chennai, Dr. J. A. H. Khatri from the School of Liberal Studies and Education at Dr. Navra Rachna University, Gujarat, Ms. Nasiba Kriba from Arabic Literary Studies at Mila University Center, Algeria, and of course, our program director. So to start of the session, I would like to invite either one of the guest speakers to start with a word of appreciation, if they could. Can we have our guest speakers on the stage, please? I think we should not take much time right now because we are eager to listen to the paper presenters. But uh, at, at the beginning, we, I would just like to add here that and request all the uh, presenters to follow the time limit so that everybody gets enough time and we can have a good question answer post the presentation. Right. Um, now, this is something uh, very interesting in terms of topic that we are looking at the new trends in language, literature, and linguistics. Now, because the, the world is changing in, in a very fast uh, what we call speed, and in last couple of years, uh, we have seen that there has been a lot of changes in academic structures as well as the way we do business and even the consumption of the content, the consumption of the literature has also changed a lot. There was a time when we could read only book. Now, if you don't actually need to buy the physical book, a printed book, and you can probably get the Kindle version or a PDF or even the entire content available on the internet. And that means the, the mediums that we used to have access uh, have changed. And that, that means that our accessibility to the world has become very, very huge. So considering that aspect, uh, our uses of language, our uses of uh, literary genres and our entire process of creating new literary works, everything will undergo certain level of uh, changes. And that we will see in, in the coming years. So what kind of changes we could uh, presuppose or what kind of changes we can observe in this present moment? Uh, that is something we as a literary people or people working in the field of language will have to take note of and we have to be really uh, aware about. So having said that, I think we should move into the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. And I would like to start off this session with Ms. Payal Gaurav Mehta with her paper on Paradox in Online English Language Learning. Thank you, Ms. Sharma. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Please start.
Okay, I'm just sharing my presentation. Uh, let me know when it is. From University of Mumbai's department presentation titled Re Representation of Women in Shashi Desh Pandey's and Enthusiak Shange's novels, a comparative study of the female protagonist. Uh, I would like to start with a quote from one of the eminent authors of second wave feminism, uh, Jumain Gri, marriage cannot be a job as it has become. The protagonist of Entozik Shange, as well as Shashi Desh Pandey, are representation of middle-class families, and therefore their marriage, taking care of home, children, and the patriarchal system seems to be the norm. Entozik Shange's quote, being alive and being a woman is all I got, but being colored is a metaphysical dilemma I haven't conquered yet. So they both talk about not just gender, but also race that has been dominant, subjugating them for, you know, for generations. Shashi Deshpande, a very renowned Indian English feminist author, uh, does not need much introduction in the Indian diaspora at least. She says, I do not call myself a feminist, a, a feminist writer. I say I am a feminist, but I don't write to propagate an ism. So though she is uh, always writing about middle-class housewives and their journeys, their, uh, their protest and challenges coming of, coming of age, she still says she doesn't support any fe feminism. Enthusik Shange, an African-American playwright, poet, novelist, and teacher was best known for her choreo poem for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Along with that, she has written number of novels like Sassafras, Cypress and Indigo, Betsy Brown, Lillian, Some Sing and Some Cry. Shashi Desh Pandey, an accomplished Indian feminist author, merits her literary career, which started much later in her life she merits her literary career to the influence of three main factors. Her father, who was an accomplished Kannada writer, her schooling in the English medium, and third, her gender. The third factor speaks much about Shashi Deshpande's involvement in women's social issues in most of her novels. She reflects on the problems and concerns of the middle-class Indian women. The selected novels from the two authors, Dark Holes, No Terror, published in 1980 by Shashi Desh Pandey, Sassafras, Cypress and Indigo, published in 82 by Anthosik Shange, Betsy Brown in 1985, a semi-autobiographical by Anthosik Shange herself again, and That Long Silence by Shashi Desh Pandey. Uh, I, I wanted to put, put the novels in this particular manner to show the flow of the publication and how they are kind of intertwined. And when it will actually come to comparison, we will see that there are so many similarities, but then each of them has their own approach towards gender, towards division by race or class. That's the reason why the flow of the novels has been put in such a way. Comparison between the authors, Shashi Desh Pandey's approach was more liberal, towards liberal feminism whereas Enthosik Shange was more radical in her writings. In fact, in her uh, novels, she is also talking about uh, lesbianism and other ways of expressing one's sexuality. Uh, Lillian, one of her other novels, in fact, is a much complex novel in narrative techniques and style of writings as well. However, both had the commonality of oppression by gender and by race. Both writers had a semi-autobiographical approach to their protagonist. The protagonist, who are taking us to the journeys of a middle-class uh, woman coming of age, Betsy Brown and her mother, Jane Brown, Sasafra, Cypress, and Indigo, three sisters, brought up by their very, very strong mother, Hilda, by herself. Sarita and her mother in 
dark holes no terror sarita's main ghost sarita's ghost or what she needs to conquer is her mother's rude words where when she says in her childhood that why didn't you die instead of your brother jaya and her mother in law in that long silence so the protagonist are the the protagonist are going to take us to the journey of course the approach and methodology to the paper is the paper will this paper will analyze the female characters in these four novels their problems and concerns and their protest against patriarchy and familial relations the protagonist will be analyzed critically through betty ferdens freedens uh, excuse my pronunciation if i'm doing it wrong theory of feminine mystique the theory of feminine mystique argues that the women should develop themselves and their intellectual abilities and fulfill their potential rather than making a choice to be just a housewife jaya in that long silence at one point it asks herself did i fail in my career of marriage did i fail my profession of taking care of my family so this is one of the theories that we will uh, i shall apply and the second theory is kate millet's theory of sexual politics which was an important piece of literature in 1970 it was one of the best sellers and the sexual politics in fact broadened the term politics and now to include all power structured relationships and posited that the personal was actually political this paper attempts to evaluate critically and present a comparative study of the two authors and their representation of their protagonist thank you very much thank you ms shilpa for the enthusiastic and informat an informative presentation now can we have a next speaker please may i start now yes ms payan government of english darjeeling government college and then uh, my the co-author of this presentation is uh, dipesh lama is a, a, a professor from the department of nepali uh, government general degree college at pedong i am trying to actually share my screen here uh, well answer transforms the size town from merely a site to story this enables the reader to examine kalimpong not just as a site of narratives but as a narrative in itself now talking about the next text underscoring speciality a socially produced space chidan kavimo's fast song a song of the soil on the other hand executes literary rejection of the kantian division between space and society transforming space from mere geography into a vitally constitutive element of society and politics fast song in the lecture language means the song of the soil which has been again translated into english by ajit baral it was be, uh, firstly written in nepali his exploration of places long obscured in shadows of the dozens of kalimpongs in kalimpong shifts the focus from fatsung being simply an egocentric story to one involved in tell telling Oh, the telling the tale of the land itself how uh, as uh, uh, i discussed before that kalimpong becomes the protagonist of this uh, story itself it is not the characters basically but it is a story and then this particular land becomes the identity of the characters as well so what we find we find the narrator when he actually travels back to a village named malbong where his friend ribdan uh, used to reside and then he got the news that there was a landslide and ribdan had been lost in the landslide it kind of it is a metaphor and then it shows that how you know the land and then the original inhabitants how they are like a Kind of you know in a landslide they have been marginalized and uh, suppressed and oppressed in such a manner that they are lost 
you know and then uh, even when we come to the end of the story we see how you know that particular character Rubden who is like so prominent in the novel yet is lost and even by the end of the novel he is lost he is not found at all all right and then uh, talking about these two texts one of the most important uh, character or uh, one of the most important thing or uh, the situation is 1986 agitation movement that is the Gorkhaland movement and how both of the texts to, uh, talk about that and Chudan Kavimo's novel Song of the Soil you know very successfully renders what happened during that particular time during that particular uh, you know year but how you know without uh, uh, you know manifesting or without revealing the violence or the violent acts you know how the story is uh, like kind of unfolded and revealed in this particular text but what do you find we find the land all right which was once which once used to be a, a place or a you know, uh, an area where, you know, the like people would live peacefully. And, and then, uh, you know, pre-1986 and pre after post-1986, it became a breeding ground for revolution and revolutionists. So you see, uh, these are the, that is how Kalimpong uh, takes, uh, you know, like it's kind of rediscovered in these two texts. So both the novels strive to do for the town of Kalimpong what Homer's The Odyssey does for the Greek identity, just as the epic serves to unify and civilize the scattered misrepresentation of the Hellenic into the single Greek by weaving together a network of geographic reference to places, this novel seeks to bring together the fragmented Kalimpong scattered across social, political, historical, and cultural divides to answer the question of what is Kalimpong. Uh, you know, because the name itself again, what it used to be and how it has changed, you know, uh, since it has been like uh, uh, changing, it has been uh, from one mouth, it goes from one mouth to the other, how the accents have changed, you know, so that is what we find here. <laughs> In this, even in this particular text. So these two novels have tried to bring uh, that out. How Kalimpong, or what is Kalimpong? And then this uh, no, uh, these two novels have uh, you know, tried to bring out or uh, to rediscover Kalimpong, the land in itself. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your captivating presentation, ma'am. Can we have the next speaker? Ms. Rhea Chetia? story of uh, Tai Fake, and uh, it is a study of the uh, acoustic analysis of the language. So starting again, uh, good evening. My name is Shreya Chitia. I am a research scholar at the English and Foreign Languages University, Shillong campus. And the topic of my presentation today is a phonemic inventory of Tai Fake and acoustic analysis. So the entire of Northeast India is uh, dominated by tonal languages and uh, Thai Faki is one of them. Uh, it is a Thai Karai language and it is spoken in 11 villages uh, in Northeast India. Uh, it is one of the five Thai varieties still spoken in Assam. The others are Kham, Thai Khamti, Thai Aiton, Thai Khamyang and Thai Turung. And uh, another linguistic uh, giant of the uh, Thai language family was Thai Ahum, but uh, it, it is a dead language now due to several social linguistic uh, factors. It is a severely endangered language with an estimated 2000 uh, native speakers, and the number is fast uh, dwindling and uh, Thai Fake is uh, soon uh, to become a moribund language. The researches uh, till date on this language have been done by Ule Wan, uh, Anthony Diller, uh, Gogoi, Amya Khang, and Stephen Mori. Stephen Mori had uh, published a thesis entitled The Thai Languages of Assam in uh, 2008. And in it, he has uh, documented the phonemic inventory and the grammars of uh, the said five, lang uh, five Thai languages. So uh, as you can see in this map, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it shows uh, the, uh, the regions of Southeast Asia where uh, Thai languages are still spoken. Uh, and uh, in Assam, uh, Thai languages are uh, spoken in 11 villages, as I have mentioned before. The area of uh, my research is located in Margarita. It's, uh, it's near Arunachal Pradesh, in, um, but it's in Assam. Uh, and uh, the villages are Borfake and uh, Tipamfake. And uh, on the right, we have the, a pie chart showing the demographics of the Thai Hake speakers. As it is evident, the Khamti speakers uh, dominate the chart uh, and it is followed by the Pake speakers. Moving on, uh, liter uh, the literature review. Um, 
Grierson first, uh, Grierson was the person, uh, the researcher who first mentioned uh, the language uh, in 1904. However, he did not uh, provide any information regarding the number of its speakers and uh, no data of uh, the grammar or the tones have been observed in his work. And uh, Dr. Uh, Bandhu Mehta uh, in 18, uh, 1987 had uh, published a uh, Paketo English Dictionary uh, and uh, it uh, contains within it a brief index of the tones that are in the language. Um, the language, yeah, it has been uh, studied by uh, the following researchers. The aim of the study is are, uh, primarily to acoustically check and analyze the segments which are uh, present in the current inventory of the Paki language for further uh, morphophonomic analysis of its tone and to uh, represent the phonemic uh, segments acoustically. Uh, another aim of the study is to uh, explore the phonemic inventory of the Faki language using modern linguistic tools like BRAT and uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, it, the, the aim of the study is to finalize and if necessary, redefine the phonemic inventory for further experimental work. Uh, the following research questions addressed in this paper. Uh, first is, how many consonant segments are there in Taipake? Secondly, how many vowel segments are there in Taipake? Thirdly, what are the acoustic characteristics of both? Uh, the methodology I have followed is uh, an animation of descriptive and uh, methods just to explain uh, different segments, acoustic and articulatory behavior in order to uh, finalize the phonemic inventory. And uh, quantitative methods have been used to points and vowel values in order to finalize the vowels. And uh, fourthly, primary data for analysis is a minimal pair list, uh, which I have derived from a one male speaker and one female uh, native speaker. And minimal uh, pair analysis has also been done on Brat software. So what are formants? Um, formants are a bit, it's a harder concept to grasp than pitch. They are basically unstable frequencies which vary with uh, external factors such as age, gender, and um, you know, so on and so forth. They help us identify places of articulation or closure in the vocal tract, and they are responsible for uh, vowel sounds. Uh, phonation analysis is usually done with the aid of uh, F1 and F2 formants as uh, they, they remain stable. Formants help us differentiate between sounds even when we whisper. For example, if we uh, say the vowel A, uh, even if we whisper it A, uh, or we say it in a higher note A, uh, it will, uh, we will always be able to recognize it as being A. Uh, being, uh, and uh, formants help us recognize the sounds. Um, so these are the consonant phonemes in Faki, which I have uh, gleaned from my uh, minimal pair analysis. So in uh, voiceless aspirated stops, uh, we have pa, the, ch, k. In voiceless uh, aspirated stops, we have pa, the, k, and glottals, uh, and uh, the glottal stop. It is uh, a phoneme. Uh, in nasals, we have ma, na, nya, na. In voiceless fricative, we, we have sa. In uh, semi-vowels, we have wa and ya. In uh, rhotic approximant, we have ra. In uh, lateral approx approximant, we have la. Moving on, uh, here is uh, analysis of the phoneme uh, fa. If, if you can see, uh, the, red, the red dots uh, on the spectrogram are the, uh, are the formants. And uh, the lowest formant is the F1 formant, and the second lowest formant is the F2 formant. And uh, this is a spectrogram uh, for the vowel O. Uh, and uh, again, we have the red dots here, uh, which uh, denote formants. And uh, the, uh, the first two rows, they denote the sound waves. And uh, this is a spectrogram for uh, a in saying, uh, which is a word which means symbols in the language. And uh, similarly, we have form and values here again. And these are the vowels in the Taipake language, which I have gleaned uh, from my research. 
And here's an example of the acoustic analysis of the speech signals. Uh, so if we can see here uh, in the spectrogram, we have uh, the darker areas. Uh, the darker areas, uh, they denote the vowel sounds and uh, there are, uh, they are more heavily voiced and therefore they are dark and they are darker in the, they appear darker in the spectrogram. Uh, so my conclusions for this uh, study are that uh, the current study has looked into the vowel segments of the Taifaki language and has uh, finalized and redefined the vowel and consonant segments. Uh, my study confirms one vowel segment which has been unreported in the previous inventory, which is A. Uh, the study documented the acoustic behavior of phonemes for further experimental study of uh, tonal change of the language. Uh, therefore, uh, since, the phon uh, since the phoneme inventory has been uh, finalized, we can move on to experimental work uh, using uh, theories like the optimality theory, et cetera. Thank you. Today, uh, my topic uh, for this conference is the poetry of T. Basudha Reddy in the global context. Here, first of all, I want to introduce T. Basudha Reddy. Uh, uh, I want to uh, request uh, something that there are some spelling mistakes and kindly ignore it. It is uh, because of, uh, because uh, I, I was in hurry, so I was not able to correct it. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, introduce uh, T. Vasudev Reddy. Uh, I was I am doing my PhD on uh, 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 T. Vasudev Reddy. He is uh, he belongs to Andhra Pradesh. He is a renowned poet, a uh, critic, and a novelist. He served as a lecturer, reader, UGC National Fellow, visiting professor, and retired as a principal of Government Degree College in 2001. He has. To his credit, 12 collection of poetry, two novels, and three critical books. He, he has multiple uh, awards, including international eminent poet in uh, 1987. He did his honorable uh, deal it from Wax San Francisco in 1988. He got Best Teacher Award from the government of Andhra Pradesh in 1990. He got Best Poetry Award in 1994. A UGC Award of National, National Fellowship in 1998 and the International Award of Excellence in World Poetry in 2009. He was holding dignitary position of the President of Guild of Indian English Writers, Editors, and Critics. He took his last breath on 26 August 2020 at the midst of a uh, corona pandemic. Now, Now I would like to know uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, according to on topic. I would like to introduce some of the poetry and uh, of uh, T. Vasudevanti. Uh, here uh, I want to quote uh, uh, quote of Krishna Sri Nivas Nivas, uh, who has a. Uh, uh, Who, who has told about uh, Reddy that uh, Mr. Reddy that he is a morning star in the firmament, the firmament of Hindu Anglia poetry. He is a poet par excellence who has profound message to convey. In this uh, presentation, I also want to uh, discuss the messages that he has put in the global context for for the humanity. The poetry I'm going to discuss here is R, mm, the restless place, peace and world. Selfish world, uh, beauty palace, etc. Globalization and degeneration of humanity. As we all know, that globalization tells us almost five decades ago. It has various aspects such as advanced technology, advent of multiple multinational, advent of multi multinational companies, lower tariffs, improved transport system, labor mobility, capital mobility, etc. It broke, etc. It broke the boundaries between countries, mitigate geographical restriction, and converted the world into a single global village. 
yet made us far more ambitious and at the same time frustrated, isolated and far from our own ideology. In this way, despite giving an easy life, it has made our soul dead. We have thrown out of the real charm of life. Globalization and regeneration of humanity. We, uh, through his poetry, The Restless Phrase, we'll discuss over it. First, uh, first of all, we all know that literature always guides, soothes, and souls us light in the midst, midst of frustration, darkness to the whole humanity. Ready, souls the restless, restlessness of man and rise, right, right. Why all this mad, restless, rattling race, mindless, jesting, and wild pursuit, no calm or joy in life like long days. Then in the very next line, he met, he met man aware, he, he met us aware of the ultimate truth and says, he surely knows limited are his days. We all are knowing that our days are limited, yet we are running after things. The second poem uh, that we are going to discuss is Peace and Love. We, ha we have found that in this modern era, the man is blind after signing rap product that came to him after breaking the boundaries of the country. Man is searching his love and peace in these products of global market. Ready in the poetry, make fun of it. Ready in his poetry, make fun of it and write latest product in the global market peace and love love in one love in one a free to stop war the last line of the poetry is really eye-opening when he writes peace and love or love and peace in eternal death or peace and love and pieces in natural mall the reality that we are facing nowadays we are not the eternal peace we are, we are not searching uh, peace and it uh, eternal peace but we are searching peace in metro mall the next poetry beauty parlor this world of forms and souls we have lost somewhere our real beauty and innocence we are running towards outer beauty that is going to vanish soon. however we have no time to think over it we are blindly running after it for it very beautifully tried to turn us towards this Truth and right, though uncertain after a certain stage, in this inexplicable exotic stage, man and women with excess money do try to buy or borrow fairer look. Beauty is as and as skin. Well, we know. Still, we run after the vanishing glow. In the last, um, in the last slide, um, I have quoted here. Um, I have quoted um, um, some lines from Paul Holmer, uh, page twenty-one, uh, who has uh, 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 that is quoted in his book, the uh, C. Uh, C. S. Lewis, the Sheep of His Path and thought published in 19, uh, 1976, he has written that literature adds to reality. It does not simply describe it. It enriches the necessary competencies that daily life requires and provides. And in this respect, it irrigates the deserts that our leaves have already become. In this way, we have seen that Mr. Uh, Reddy's poetry have taught us the eternal Think the uh, the universal things that that as a human as a human being we need to know we we are forgetting our uh, the real peace and real 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 essence of life in the dining uh, world of market and malls. So we should uh, realize the real thing, uh, real uh, beauty of life. Thank you. thank you all. Okay. Okay, uh, this is Arunya from Badidasan University, Trichy, and the title for today's presentation is Animal Symbolism in Anuradha Rice, the Folded Earth. So, in, this is basic, this comes under the field of eco-criticism, and in order to, in literature, when we have to talk about, uh, when we have to connect nature and literature, 
it comes under the concept of ecocriticism. In as ecocriticism as put forth by Cheryl Plotfilty, it is the study of relationship between literature and the physical environment. Uh, this field has emerged in response to various environmental problems, and it is also an emerging discipline which began during the 1990s. And ecocriticism has derived its insight from various uh, other fields such as philosophy, feminism, Marxism, sociology, environmental studies, and also from other disciplines working at the level of discourse and application. It takes an earth-centered approach that examines the treatment of nature in literature. So when the quest, there's always a question that when we talk about literature and environment, the question arises if it is a subdiscipline of literary studies or an extension out of literary studies into environmental studies as it deals with environmental issues. So it can also be a practice that is largely imbibed within the paradigms of humanities and social sciences as well. And the texts that appear in this field are either conceptual or it is experiential based on the writer's ex own experience. So they emphasize on various environmental problems directly in the text or in a certain way. So the topic, like I have chosen the author Anuradha Roy. She's an Indian novelist, editor, and a journalist. Uh, initially, she worked at Oxford University Press as an editor, and later she, along with her husband, Rukun Advani, founded their own publishing company called Permanent Black, and they published a number of books for many Indian uh, authors and writers. So some of her novels have been shortlisted and longlisted for various awards, and I have chosen one among them, that is The Folded Earth. A very basic idea about The Folded Earth is, um, it is about Maya, the protagonist, who is a widow, who wanted to make a new life in, in a place called Raniket, which is a tiny village in the foothills of Himalayas. She has uh, chosen this place in order to overcome the grief of her own personal tragedy, that is the loss of her husband. And uh, something special about this Raniket, this place is, where people lived in coexistence with nature. And um, she lived in, uh, she lived with the landlord, like uh, named Divan Shakib, and there was a family nearby them, Ama, Charu, and Pura. So the main purpose of this study is, this. I have put it in a simple way that uh, to move from the humanocentric attitude to an ecocentric attitude. Uh, it can also be considered as an, from, to move from ego consciousness to eco consciousness. Um, this can be achieved through uh, understanding, maybe realizing the fact that environment also possesses certain intrinsic value and so that we can maintain a biocentric equality with them and lead to change our attitude from an anthropocentric to ecocentric view. So the, there are various instances in the novel which portrays uh, the humanocentric attitude uh, where the homocentric or humanocentric is nothing but where humans are considered to be the center or norm, And the natural world is seen as something that's entirely in relation to human needs. And if they are viewed in relation to human needs and to satisfy the needs of human. Mm. So in this folded earth, I, I would like to cite a single example from which the anthropocentric or homocentric attitude is expressed by the characters. So okay, there's a character, Devan Shahib, who talks about or who tells the story of a Nawab who, was in, who loved horses and he has also a few favorite horses and named them after Mughal kings and queens such as Noor, Jahangir, Babar, Humayun. And every morning this Nawab would visit the horses, feed them and Without uh, the, he maintains them or he takes care of them with utmost care. But when there was a situation when the Nawab, during the partition, when the Nawab had to leave India, it was surprising for everybody that the Nawab uh, went one morning, he woke up and went to the horses, as usual, fed them and shot them with his own horses. Um, so that with, with his own hunting rifle, which though Nawab is believed to some is believed to be one who disapproved of hunting always. So this expresses the um, homocentric attitude of human beings at the extreme when it is of no use 
to us or when it does not relate to us, we go to the extent of even killing them. So, and there is another incident about for, um, which represents the ego consciousness of man, uh, with Mr. Chow Hon, who was the magistrate. And uh, when he, he was in the position to send uh, the Puran, like uh, Puran, who is a character from the novel, it was a situation when Puran was sent to oh, a zoo, it would save the life of a deer called Rani. But uh, because of the ego consciousness of Mr. Chow Han, he refused to send this, this man uh, and it caused the death of the dear uh, Rani. And uh, there are also various other instances, animal symbols, where domestication of animals, in a way, domestication of animals can also be considered uh, as something which is viewed for the benefit of human needs. And there are characters which portray uh, such attitudes, Ama and Charu, there's another character who was affectionate towards animals which are left under her care. And here, as I talk about animal symbols, animals are also portrayed in a way as part of our everyday life. So the basic idea, uh, the basic idea is to move from the homocentric attitude towards uh, the ecocentric attitude. So it is uh, the responsibility of us to move from ego consciousness to eco consciousness. That's all. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Raja Sharma and my presentation ID is 42 and I'm here to present my paper on the topic Ecos from the Origin, Evaluating Diasporic Connections to Homeland. And the paper is a combined effort of me and my supervisor, Dr. Shutamita Mehta. Diasporic notion of homeland and home is not merely an unrequited desire for a lost homeland, but a homing desire. The return to homeland cannot be characterized as the failure of migrants to adapt. Instead, it is the self-realization, a self-realization of their moral obligations and responsibilities. The immigrants try to establish themselves in their land, even after a long time has passed, only when they find their place intact. However, they fail to see that connection when their homeland undergoes significant unwelcome changes. This failure to connect causes the emigre to feel alone, alone and disjointed, without any security in the altering religio-political environment of the homeland. A similar predicament can be observed in the multitudes of works produced by diasporic authors like M.G. Vasanji, Chumpa Lahiri, and uh, Bharati Mukherjee across time and space. <laughs> Sorry, there is, there is home. Needed to be in one place? Is it always attached to territory? Salman Rushdie perceives the intersection of home and exile in, relations, in relation to new interstitial space located on the margins of two cultures and yet retains its own distinctiveness, its own center. As it puts it, and I quote, sometimes we feel that we straddle between two cultures. At times, we fall between two stools. But however ambiguous and shifting this ground may be, it is not an infertile territory for a writer to occupy." Unquote. Is, is a homeland a prerequisite a, a perceive for, in order to perceive a diaspora? The question will sound absurd to the ears of older generation laureates who have established the desire to return to land as one of the essential facets of the diasporic community. Etymologically also, it makes a lot more sense to comprehend that diaspora cannot be without homeland because in its word, which means dispersion, logically, if there is a scattering, there needs to be a source or origin. In the, uh, the present slide uh, gives the definition of diaspora as given by Safran and Cohen, and both of them have emphasized on the importance of past connections and homeland in the diasporic identity. The concept of home often performs an important function in our lives. It can be a valuable means of orientation by giving a sense of our place in the world. To be at home, is to occupy a location 
where we are welcomed, where we can be with the people very much like ourselves. Thus, the term home connotes not only the place where we originate from, but also the place where we belong. They dream all the time. They yearn for the land they left behind, the image of which they carry in their psyches. They live their lives. They carry out their daily activities in a new country, a newly adopted country, where they are trying to find new roots and establish themselves. And home remains just like a picture in the frame. A home is a home that exists somewhere else across the borders and is separated in time and space. In this discontinuity, the division between past and present, here and there, the home is imagined in fragments and fissures. Although the concept of homing desire has been discussed at length by diasporic authors and critics, including Rashdi, Bhava, Avtar Bra, Uma, Parveshmar, uh, Uma Parveshmaran, and Jasbir Jha. It should be not be forgotten that home for diaspora is a place of no return, as home isn't, isn't home anymore to them, be it the first generation or the second generation. Home is merely a mirage created by the, by, by the people in their minds. It keeps eluding them. A person can only be born in one place. However, he may die several times elsewhere in the exiles and prisons and in a homeland transformed by occupation and oppression into a nightmare. For a diaspora, home is an emotion. And when the homeland changes, the diaspora is unable to comprehend its individuality. Diaspora struggles to survive in the new land, even after its physical disconnect from the native place. But an emotional disconnect breaks his mental construct. For example, the diasporas who migrated before the partition of India can never find their home intact in the divided India. The exclusion on the basis of religion and caste in their own land breaks the immigrants at many four levels. Diaspora gets isolated of their disconnect from their homeland. They are treated as the other. The feeling of otherness, which constantly haunts immigrants in the foreign land, grabs them more tightly in the homeland and strangles them to the extent that diaspora finds breathing difficult. Although homeland does exist geographically, it might become an unwelcoming place with which the diaspora could not identify politically, ideologically, or socially. The cohesive force connecting the migrant to the homeland loosens, and the diaspora stands nowhere. And the so-called home looks far more alien than the adopted land. The, the change in the religious political status of homeland puzzles the migrants and leads them to a state of in-betweenness not of either or, but of neither nor. These, these are the findings which I have tried to explore through the analysis of M.G. Vasanji's 2019 novel named as A Delhi Obsession, wherein the protagonist undergoes the same dilemma and faces the exclusion at homeland at multiple levels and hence is unable to find himself as an individual identity. Thank you. respective chairpersons, fellow paper presenters, and members of the audience. I'm Ashita Rathod, currently pursuing my PhD from Bansipula University, Bhopal. And today I'm going to talk about modernist influences on interpersonal relationships in May Bridgley's conflicts. Now, before we directly hop on to the writer or the work that I have taken up, I'm very quickly going to talk about the concept of modernism. And as we all know, modernism is a very pertinent topic in the sense that there are multiple elements that have uh, come forth as a byproduct of the two world wars, the disillusionment that happened. And we undergoing modernism and postmodernism. But despite all of this, one thing that uh, really has somewhere uh, been neglected 
is the simplicity of human life and how that has been influenced by modernism. Whenever we are talking about modernism, there is always a lot of uh, negative concoction as to what is happening, how is it influencing people. It is heavily uh, uh, linked to trauma and bad experiences. On the other hand, there is a positive towards modernism as well. And that is what we get to see when we discuss Maeve's works. Now, of course, I'm not going to touch on all the elements due to the paucity of time, but these are some basic elements which we can find in Maeve's works, any of her works if we pick them up. And the elements include individualism, universalism, non-conformity, intellectual and emotional bravery, and anonymity. First and foremost, when we talk about modernism, Charles Baudelaire coined this term in 1864, and he gives this very uh, beautiful definition in his work, The Painter of Modern uh, Life. In that, he goes on to define modernism as uh, something which is transient, fleeting, and contingent. It is one half of the art, the other half being the eternal and the immovable. Now, this definition in its own self is telling us that modernism is erupting on the scene to basically disrupt everything that we have been familiar with till now. And because of this, there is a breakdown from tradition that we can see, and there is a disillusionment that is happening. When we look at the characters of Maeve Winchy, especially when we talk about the work quantums, they, they drive on these pillars. We, we are going to find characters choosing to live their life not by how society dictates them because the concept of society and the societal validation has sort of eradicated. When we look at the words intellectual and emotional bravery, the reason I did not choose the word intelligence here, a very basic thing is that when we are talking about intellectually or emotionally intelligent people, these are sensible people who are taking care of the situation. They understand what is the situation and adapt to it. On the other hand, when we talk about Maeve's characters, they are going to be emotionally brave. They are going to be intellectually brave. That means these are characters who are making certain choices and deciding to live with them rather than cribbing about it or going into a trauma. So we see that there's a continuity that is happening. This, there is this fast paced motion in their lives and they are living it by the moment, not thinking too much or dwelling in the past, which is a very prominent feature if you look otherwise in the writings of modernist writers. There is also the concept of anime, which we can find. So anime was basically coined by Emil Durkheim. And he talks about anime as a state where we are talking about a condition of instability because everything that is known, all the set norms that are known, they are completely demolished. So what do we do in that sort of a situation? Because there is no textbook on which you can rely. However, anime has been described in a very uh, negative way in multiple uh, in the writings of multiple writers. When we talk about Maeve, she gives a very really positive outlook towards this. So consider yourself as somebody who's hungry and you've just entered uh, this uh, buffet hall and there is a variety of dishes that you can choose from. And it's totally up to you. That is how Maeve brings out her characters who are taking responsibility for the choices that they are going to make. And they are bravely moving, continuously moving towards positive outcomes, despite all the negative things happening to them. Now, very quickly, I'm going to move on to the writer that is Maeve Binshi. She is famously known as the writer who journaled Ireland. Now, why her works become uh, very critical for us to study is because Ireland and India, they share a lot of commonality. We gained our independence in 1947. Ireland gained its independence in 1949. Now, Maeve was born in 1939 and she lived up to 2012. Uh, she died due to a cardiac attack. Now, when we look at her, she has lived through the transition that happened in Ireland. And that same transition is something that India has been going through. So culturally, both Irish and Indian people are said to be very emotional people who are extremely uh, chatty about their experiences, who bond with people on emotions, and we are drawn towards our culture. So when this wave of modernism through technological advancement, capitalism, and various other factors is coming into our personal lives, this is what Maeve goes on to capture. 
her journey and her own experiences form a great role in writing the characters that she does because um, in her own life as you can see uh, or estimated by her picture she is uh, she is a woman who is 6 feet tall very stout garrulous hefty and she struggled with body image issues early on in her life she was told that you know she would end up as a spinster but then from a class teacher to a person who became a journalist in the Irish Times and then to becoming a published author who goes on to publish 16 novels and four short story collections. She herself goes through a character arc and she comes of age. And that is something we can experience when we talk about her characters. Now, this is a very famous uh, line that she said in one of her interviews. We are nothing if we are not loved when you meet somebody who's more important to you than yourself. That has to be the most important thing in life, really. The key point being that I also believe very, very strongly that everybody is the hero or heroine of his own life. Which brings me to quantum, that is the work in the study. In a very uh, simple line, I have just summarized the plot of it. It is basically the story of a generation which is being told. Uh, through the history of a restaurant. So the basic idea is we have this character by the name of Ella Brady, who is uh, filming this documentary about this restaurant named Quantum's, which has stood there in the city for the last 50 years. And through the, do through the documentary, we get to unravel the lives of so many people who are somewhere in some manner linked to this place called Quantum's. Now, very quickly going to the bullets that I've tried to cover in my paper is that the characters are exemplifying a plethora of relationships. That means that every character is not going through something that is um, very typical. As we can see, conventionality versus unconventionality, unconventionality tries to show up in the format where interpersonal relationships are being questioned. We have the character of Ella, who is our principal character. She was just a, a girl in her mid-20s. And she goes on to have uh, personal relationships with a person who is in his middle ages and is married already. So this is an indication of how the modern times are giving an autonomy to the lady to forge relationships, interpersonal relationships, partnerships, and forge friendships, which are not at all conventional. Going forth, we have this struggle between public and personal. So unlike uh, other works where we get to see that people are constantly going through that dilemma, in Maeve's works, we get to see that these characters have a very clear boundary regarding their personal life and what is to be uh, made public. These personal boundaries end up being so strong at the end of the day for the younger generation that they are even withholding them when it comes to their parents. The relationship of kinship and what a family means, they modify from just uh, being about uh, your immediate family or your kins to what support system you can inculcate through the method of a found family. So Ella here goes on to live separately from her parents and she goes on to build her own network in life, which is filled with friends, which is filled with connections that she has forged, she has forged later on. When we talk about uh, quantum, the title in its own self, it is functioning uh, and telling us how architecture of a city can function as an emotional support for people. And that is what it's all about. Through all these characters that are going to be there, uh, let it be Nora, Brenda Brennan, or uh, Brother Rooney. These multiple characters form a cobweb, and for all of these characters, this place ends up providing a shelter in times of need. It provides a sense of space. It gives them that autonomy to make decisions for themselves and saves them from the public eye. At last, one of the other features that we get to see in this particular work is the changing definitions of morality as to what is right and what is wrong. Are we going to live by the rules of the society or uh, is it more important to actually introspect and see what is really relevant to us and makes us feel truer to ourselves? So with this, uh, these are the words that I have uh, used as my references. I'd like to end my presentation with this very famous quote by Maeve when she herself, which goes on to say that in her novel, there are uh, no ugly ducklings turning into swans. There are ugly ducklings that are turning into confident ducks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such an insightful Thank presentation, Ms. Sashita. You're most welcome. Can we have our next speakers, please? 
my topic is teaching literature literature in elt traditional approaches methods and the need for new approaches today keywords communicative competence communicative language teaching english language teaching english as second or foreign language teaching genres of literature Hello. Speaking, reading, and writing. As an introduction, I would like to say the emergence of communicative approach in 1970. Through that approach, focuses on language teaching, and especially concentrating on communicative competence. It has motivated many language teachers to emphasize their teaching strategies on attainment of communicative competence. In this regard, the threat of starts becoming not popular when the orientation of language teaching and learning is mostly focused on the functional view. Here, I would like to address the following question: What is literature? What approach is required to use literature for teaching English? What are the reasons for using literature in ELT? How to use literature for teaching English? And what are the advantages of using various genres of literature in ELT? What is literature? Generally speaking, literature is a cultural document of country or countries, but some consider it as art, according to Eagleton. Whereas John McCarthy, nineteen ninety four, in his book discuss. Distinguishes between literature starting with the capital L and literature with the capital L. So, what is difference between capital literature, literature starting with the capital in the letter L, that is mostly concentrating on classical work, for example, Shakespeare, Dickens, etc. Whereas, we concentrate on, for some people, concentrate on. Literature starting with the L, which is recognized as popular fiction, fables, song lyrics, etc. So in ELT, teachers should use literature with a small L, that is, for novice and intermediate uh, for intermediate learners, but should use literature for high intermediate and advanced learners, which is starting with the capital L. Then we talk about the uh, different types of model approach models for teaching literature. There are mainly three kinds, according to Lasser. Language-based model where teachers focus on language components such as vocabulary, grammar, meaning, etc. The other method is language as content where teachers require to use different genres of literature to teach components in their classroom for poetry for teaching pronunciation. For example, short story to teach translation. A third type of model is literature for personal enrichment. All teachers may use certain literary works as the basis for selecting a particular activity to apply in the classroom. For example, a drama can be taken to express the students to their feelings and show expression. What are the reasons to include literature in ELT? Literature is useful in developing students' linguistic knowledge. It increases their motivation to interact with the students. It increases their reading proficiency. It enhances students' understanding of foreign culture, and it also provides valuable authentic material. Carley and Sladler in 1990 book states four major underlying reasons to use literature in ELT. First one is literature as a valuable authentic material. Secondly, literature gives language enrichment. Thirdly, literature gives personal involvement. Fourthly, literature gives cultural enrichment. How to use literature for teaching English? The teachers are required to analyze three things regarding the literary work. First, the teachers need to know the types of literary work that they are using or they are using in the classroom. Secondly, teachers should need to analyze the difficulty level of the selected literary work in terms of grammar, lexical items, and text patterns. Thirdly, the teachers need to analyze and ensure that a literary work brings pleasure and enjoyment to the learners. 
we have to consider what are the advantages of teaching various genres of literature in ELT. For example, poetry. In poetry, students learn to appreciate the writer's creative process by breaking down poems into their constituent parts, drawing a linguistic and intellectual sensitivity that could eventually develop into a more profound interest. If you take drama, it motivates the imagination and encourages innovative thinking. It fosters linguistic development and heightens effective listening skills. Thirdly, to reinforce a positive self-concept and foster peer respect and group cooperation. If we consider short stories, you can say the students, while teaching short stories, it enhances kids' reading comprehension. It broadens higher level of readers' perspective on many cultures. It offers more innovative and challenging texts. It is used as an authentic context, and then it encourages students to read. If we take novels for teaching, we can say it is an authentic reading material. It increases students' motivation to read. It provides real life or real life life setting. It permits students to use their creativity, improves critical thinking skills, opens the door to teaching the target language culture. Let me conclude. Reading literature can give new views and the freedom to analyze, connect, and ask questions and conduct investigation. In conclusion, literature provides students with an unrivaled rich reservoir of real content in a range of registers. If students have access to this knowledge through the growth of literary competency, they can internalize the language at a high level with effectiveness. Today, many teachers make an effort to incorporate literature into their classes, but many lack the expertise and training. There should be a striking balance between the study of literature and the teaching of the English language. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't open before you are creative. I have already mailed you. Dr. N. Sadak College, Ramanadapuram, Tamil Nadu. And my, the topic of my paper is projection of surrealism as a usually unusual portrayal of events with reference to my results. Nothing is strange. Next slide. Sir, it's not moving actually. The creative potential of the unconscious mind through the irrational juxtaposition of images. As it is written here, um, it serves as a bridge between dream world and unconscious. So uh, my third slide, sir, it's not working. Can you please work it for me, sir? Third slide, sir. Surrealism in literature. In literature, surrealist writers were interested in the associations and implications of words rather than their literal meaning. Their works are thus extraordinarily difficult to read. It just presents the contradictory juxtapositions of events. And uh, um, the next slide, please, sir. Mike Rizal is a writer and a cartoonist who currently works as a freelancer in creating cartoon images for journals his cartoons and stories are always with surrealist touch. His major works are The Sabbath with Vampire Unleashed and my favorite is Nothing is Strange. And Nothing is Strange is a collection of 20 short stories which features the bizarre and strange illustrations. Some of the 20 short stories are really short that it, that it is written within two pages. Each short story contains the feelings of surrealist snapshot. All these stories feels like uh, uh, feels like entering into a surrealist art gallery. The symbolic representations like earth inside human mouth, disappearing words from diaries, and some fascinating sequences pictured by Russell made his short stories a uh, reservoir of surrealism. And nothing is, uh, nothing is Strange contains uh, 20 short stories, as I said previously. Uh, some of the short stories are uh, it is uh, visible on the screen. Uh, you can see the meeting, Barry and the triplets, extraordinary LC, and the miracle. Everything contains the sequences of surrealism, uh, which is fully presented by uh, Russell in his stories. And Freud and surrealism. The next slide, please, sir. Freud uh, concentrated much on uh, the psychic automatism. The psychic automatism is a process that encouraged freeing of the mind from rational and utilitarian values and constraints, as well as moral and aesthetic judgment. 
Freud was actually suspicious of the surrealist. However, his theories of unconscious, the unconscious fear, desires, and conflicts um, was well presented by surrealist writers in their works. Andre Britton, Andre Britton was uh, the father of surrealism. He explicitly rejected attempts to read surrealist art as revealing the individual artist's psychological history. Also, unlike Freud and his fellow psychoanalyst, the surrealist has no interest in therapeutic potential of the Freud's theories. They were interested in and the unconscious as the creative source and not in the possibility of healing neurosis like psychoanalytic therapy. And uh, the next slide, please, sir. Lacan and surrealism. Um, though Lacan's psychoanalysis and surrealism are the mutual fascination of uh, dreams, symbolisms, uh, altered or antisocial states of mind, Lacan criticized surrealist the most. And uh, thus, uh, through the characters created by Russell, the scenes and the settings uh, imaged by, his, by him in his stories, it is obvious that the surrealism is a usually unusual representation of events. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Communication through walking the little trans philosophy of despair and hope. So uh, coming to uh, the agenda that I'm going to describe in this paper, uh, particularly in this presentation, I will be briefly uh, Introducing the little trend that is screen persona created by Charlie Chaplin, and then coming uh, will be coming to communication through gesture. How the, this particular screen persona communicates with the gesture rather than talking. So then I will be discussing about the philosophy of walking, what is involved, what philosophical background is involved in this, and then coming to type of walk. And I will be giving some examples from the select film. Then of course moving will be moving to the conclusion. So introducing the little tramp screen persona, the little tramp uh, screen uh, persona was uh, created by Charlie Chaplin, who happens to be uh, one of the most prominent director filmmaker in, in silent era. So Chaplin himself describes this particular screen persona on two bases. One is on appearance, second is on function. And we can see that this particular fellow, the little tramp appears like this. Uh, and and on the basis of appearance, and I quote from Charlie Chaplin's autobiography that he says that I had no idea what makeup to put on. I did not like my getup as the press reporter. However, on the way to wardrobe, I thought I would dress in a baggy pants, big shoes, a cane, and a derby hat. So uh, this is how that little tramp appeared. Uh, and then uh, on the basis of function, he described that, you know, this fellow is uh, many sided, a tramp, a gentleman, a poet, a dreamer, a lonely fellow always hopeful of romance and adventure. He would have you believe is a scientist, a musician, a pol uh, polo player. So uh, particularly it approves how Charlie Chaplin, when he employed this particular uh, screen persona called the little tramp, he was trying to gesticulate through his gesture, through the gesture of the little tramp to show that how postmodernist uh, 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 idea of uh, walking uh, gestures works like uh, well, and, and particularly he described the idea of walking, uh, walking the particular gesture of walking so uh, in that uh, how he communicates through gestures and in gesture through walking so although we can see sometimes he is speaking uh, uh, and here i'm talking about the little tramp the skin persona so this little tramp the skin persona was basically created for to be employed in the silent film. When the silent film disappeared, this screen persona also disappeared because he had no value or existence at all without the silence, without the gesture. When word invaded, he disappeared simply. So he, so I, uh, although, and I quote from Edward, uh, although he can sometimes be seen speaking, he doesn't need to, unlike most of the characters in silent films, he, he could have existed comfortably in the silent world. And working for the little tramp is talking. It can be understood as a language having its own vernacular, dialects, and idioms expressing intentionality. Walking conveys a wealth of information about the walker's identity, importance, condition, and destination. Onlookers attribute their own meaning to the walker seen in a walk, uh, a statement of purpose or a declaration to be heeded. So, uh, 
walking through walking, the particular skin persona represents everything. He communicates his idea, philosophy through his walking. So I've employed taken philosophical background from these two books. One is by Frederick Gross, that is titled uh, A Philosophy of Walking, and second is Rootless Guide of Walking. So uh, in philosophy and ruthless guide of walking says that i tried to notice how i felt and here the writer is describing about the phenomenology of walking i tried to notice how i felt and thought while walking my thoughts move more easily from one subject to another leading me to the analogy of water i began thinking of physics and how it applied to my thought process specifically hydronomics i thought about the mind as a pipe and and whether there is a limit to how much or how fast I can think. So fear walking becomes an element of uh, a pipeline to think to 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 think about the philosophical world or other ideas that are related to life. And then uh, I have talked briefly about uh, types of walks and given instances. So there are so many kinds of walks in Charlie Chaplin film that have been employed through this particular screen persona that is called the little tramp so the words uh adorable tramp himself defines his work he trans to this plot system trembles lumber systems clumps storms stumbles marches clumps to make us laugh and cry a person who travels from place to place a vagabond on foot in search of work or what the one who begs is essentially a tramp though he is silent we can hear his footsteps because they are heavy it is tramp his marching feet marching towards humanity in search of love compassion and composure his thirst of glee transcending to existence globe and paper i have given this particular uh, three examples three uh, that relates to different kind of works and uh, uh, there uh, yeah Yes, and then three kinds of work, walk in the street uh, that can be seen in the film, The Kid, and the walk of ignorance that can be seen in the gold dress, and walk of emotion can be seen in the city lights. Uh, I have described all this uh, in the paper in details, but here they do uh, lack of time, I cannot do that. And then moving on to conclusion part of the paper. So this is the idea that I conclude. Uh, in my through my paper, the project of the time transformed to the Grossian idea. Grossian here uh, stands for the Frederick Gross, who has written the book Philosophy of Walking. For he is a worker who doesn't believe in the establishment and always remains out of context of the fellow wings. The tramp belongs to the street and always finds the media of the street as a major subject of inquiry, questioning their connection to one's subjective experience and identifying it as a space that encapsulates everybody. Uh, every day is ex existence and the quotidian. And throughout the entire career, unless Chaplin finally succumbed to the sound cinema, the tramp remains a mere observer who does not accept the periodic clear sense of functionalization and objectivity of purpose. The little tramp explores every dimension of human beings with the help of activity of walking, which, result, which resultantly reveals every aspect of humanity by being funny, serious, sad, lonely, and optimistic. So uh, this is all from this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and your patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for presenting your paper. Can we have the next and the last presentation for the day, please? We have been doing this since two years, since pandemic, March 2020. Then to we all, I mean, uh, th those who are from teacher teaching fraternity, they all have been uh, using Zoom uh webex and other platforms we all have been trained for that but then too sometimes it happens that technical glitch stucks us in between this is all about it what could have been better example of that that we all have seen that is paradox in online english language learning this is offline english language le learning has uh it, it was obviously very easy uh if now onwards uh, in teacher fra teaching fraternity it would be considered as pre covid 19 zone and post covid 19 zone and as earlier it was simple but in after covid 19 it was very difficult because it was the herculean task for teachers to specifically make 
if we talk about first primary and secondary education for kids of course it was very difficult because gadgets has to be given uh, by the guardians and specifically of course it has affected their pockets as well whether we consider it or not but yes it was very difficult for the parents to manage and then to control them after giving the gadgets on the one hand the all the facilities facilitations are given and on the other hand the expectations are such that it has to be used with limitation and with wisdom that was the greater paradox that happened during this time and the second thing which was there that it was quite ironical that the teacher themselves need to learn as students first because before teaching gen next or this gen z if we use their terminology particularly not gen x not gen y this is gen z that they, they they may be better equipped than the teachers in current scenario because many a times they were using dual devices uh, they they would give any technical glitch reason they'll keep the video off and they'll be doing any of the other things along with the study if it is offline it would have been very easy because the one to one communication would be there face to face communication would be there in virtual presentation in virtual learning and specifically when it comes to language it is very crucial because in language the first aspect that has to be taken into consideration is communication and communication abc will not be fulfilled at its required or at its expected level because it is online language learning now the methodology that has been used for this particular paper was the research design that was collecting information for the study where a survey by the means of questionnaire and in depth interview of course it was taken telephonically and with the number of respondents and across the various institutes were taken and as i am located in gujarat i took the uh, i collected the data from gujarat itself and the questionnaire contained 20 questions and it was included of six sub questions as well which helped me to come to the conclusion through this methodology the real issues that i could sum up with that i have tried as per the time limit what i could mention over here that the problem is that no single tool platform is yet able to provide a one stop solution to the teachers specifically uh, students will come at the second step at the first step the real issue was to make comfortable give the comfort zone and to make teachers enable to deliver and to exchange all the information and all the knowledge that which they used to with their classroom experience with which they were familiar with in which the comfort zone was already set so stepping out of the comfort zone that too with so many things to be kept in mind that was the first issue that was to be taken care of and second was virtual presence is essentially e presence but may not ensure mind and body presence even in each of the things that ha this has to be in continuation and hence the adequacy of e platform to develop effective and efficient human manpower is a big question to be addressed after that it, it is if we talk about the country like india or other sark nations where access and speed of the internet is also an issue suppose the student is very sincere they they always wanted to be in the e class virtually they wanted to they, they were so inclined to get all the information and to be interactive but because of the disturbance because of the internet speed because of the unavailability of required resources for for uh, establishing the teacher and student relationship for establishing the communication it was the the question to be addressed and it was of the great concern that has been observed because india is not only about the urban places it is also it, it lives in rural areas as well and even in urban areas there were the parts where the internet facility or the internet speed was not which was required for the study and the virtual reality to teach could only remain in dreams that is what uh, the almost all the the questionnaire and the result of that could sum up that of course the schooling and teaching until and unless it is not found interesting it is not much interactive it is not continuously on the pose that where interpersonal communication is uh, included it was very difficult to keep the track smart classes may or may not make a child smart but have made their parents smarter 
this is what the another result which has shown and another thing is such classes are wholly dependent upon uninterrupted and smooth internet connectivity and many a times it could be any technical glitch which we have just observed i was just uh, i was having a smile when i was uh, seeing all the different presentations when somewhere cursor was not moving when somewhere the ppt was not getting changed somewhere two devices were to be used because the voice was not coming up even i mine was the very first presentation pratham gase makshika that is how in sanskrit it is described although i'm very much uh, I, I consider myself technically sound and that myth was broken today that it was not I was not able to change all the things and I was not able to do that. After that, it was the current shift to virtual and online pedagogy is further going to impact the entire scenario adversely and due to India and other emerging nation because the one methodology or one platform is still a big question. After that, just moving to the learning language, English and online, in which three presence are required, in which first is social presence, where it is uh, the feeling of oneness is there, the feeling of connectivity has to be established, which is getting lacked, which is missing when it is online class. Another thing is cognitive presence, when it is the text-based discourse facility and engagement, it has to be there and student, were having thanks to google and all the search engines they were having more information but they were having less they were less informed about the actual thing which is required to be addressed this is about the cognitive presence of them and teaching presence that the design and organization of the course has to be maintained other than the uh, added on add on perks which comes with the online learning and technology made work easier for the students, but difficult for the faculties, especially language faculties. The work has definitely become harder than what it used to be. Uh, the discussion and conclusion, the, the, it, it came, I came to the conclusion by this paper and I really enjoyed that the paradoxes described in the paper have no easy resolution. Let's get real about it. It, it is no, not a rosy path, but the thing is that the paradoxes are the ways for understanding this online learning and to get adjusted with that. And online courses requires more work on the part of both learners and instructors. Right now, it is that the burden is more on the instructors and the learners are just at the reception end where they are ready to receive, but they are not ready to walk one mile more for getting the instructions and online courses requires more effort from the faculty and instructor again than the face-to-face -face instructions because that was obviously more easier and when it comes to physical barrier that is related to the technical aspects it is very difficult to get over and recommendations from the paper that I could come to the conclusion through the discussion and conclusion, the recommendations that could be given, that is professional development for online educators, not only about the technology, but about the online pedagogy is the need of an hour, which is required to be developed uh, in a proper methodological manner. And rethink course design and appropriate technology to facilitate student engagement with the content and development of facilitation skills for online learning these are all about the paper presentation that i made thank you so much it was really an enlightening sessions and thank you thank you to the organizers and wonderful uh, uh, curators over here who who guided everyone very nicely thank you so much Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for the deeply resonating presentation we all can relate to. And if I have the program director's permission, can we move to the valedictorian session? Yes, before that, uh, anyone remaining in this session for the presentation? Uh, yes, so we do have Dr. Veil Satya with please invite, the please invite once remaining candidates. Sure, sir. Suppose anyone have joined for the direct presentation. Sure, sir. Yeah. Do we have Dr. Veel Satya, V. Vijay Ajay Lakshmi, Mani Bharati VP? Do we have any of these presenters for the day?
I repeat, we have Dr. Veel Satya, Vijay Lakshmi, Ms. Mani Bharati VP, Yeah, not in the way. So shall I start? Yes, please. I would like to thank our organizers, Research Culture Society, Algeria, and our supporters, School of Languages, Literature and Linguistics, EU. And I would also like to thank our speakers for the day and all the presenters for the presentations. Our speakers for the valedictorian session are Dr. J.A.H. Khatri, who is an assistant professor at the School of Liberal Studies and Education of Rajna University, Gujarat. Ms. Masooda Bodrajida, who is an associate professor at Mila University, Central Algeria. Abdur Rahim Bodrbain, who is an associate professor at Mila University, Algeria. And last but not the least, Barbasha Mondal, who is an assistant professor of English at the Saldora Nitaji Centenary College, West Bengal, India. Can we have our speakers, please? Yes, please invite second number. Sure, sir. Can we have Dr. J. H. Khatri? Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, sir. I hope I'm audible to all of you. Audible. So, and I was just. Uh, there in the previous session and we had quite a variety of presentations in the previous session and this variety is in fact, in fact uh, something that goes with the title of our uh, seminar that is global trends and we are specifically talking about uh, three areas that is the language literature and linguistics in fact, we don't normally differentiate between language and linguistics. Because linguistics is a study of language. But uh, when we say language, at the same time, we are also referring to the other aspects associated with the language. Let's say the culture, the lifestyle. And ultimately, what we are seeing as literature is a result of uh, that way of living that includes uh, the certain lifestyles, certain rituals, certain languages, certain vernacular aspects. And as we have seen in the last presentation by Dr. Mehta, that we as a teaching community have faced a lot of trouble in the last two, three years due to online and offline change. And this change is not just restricted to the classrooms or to the universities. This change has also affected the idea of content creation, the idea of literature creation, the idea of art creation. There, there used to be exhibitions earlier and you have to visit the exhibition places and check those work of arts. Now I've seen in last three years that there are virtual exhibitions and you can see those exhibitions uh, in, in your mobile, it, it your computer, a laptop. And that literally means that the very idea and the very perception of the art, the very idea of literature has made a digital leap when Marshall McLuhan used to talk about mechanical bride, probably the mechanical bride is very old now. Now we have digital bride and our, our forms are completely changing, including the, the kind of language, the kind of vernacular, the kind of varieties we are using. Because uh, there was a time like when I was studying, I studied in the Gujarati medium school and we started studying English language in the fifth standard. And in fact, we studied English literature uh, in Gujarati medium. So we did not have any other exposure to the English language apart from the classroom. So it was very, very difficult for a learner like me to, let's say, to, to develop a competency in 
the english language we were very good at reading we were very good at writing but when it comes to speaking listening we had no exposure today my 5 year old kid he watches english videos on youtube and he knows the words that i don't even know so the thing is they their learning process is not just restricted to the classroom they are now exposed to the entire world and they can learn from anywhere their language is affected by any of these mediums that they are accessing similarly in terms of literature as well the that was as i said in the beginning earlier that we used to get the printed book and we used to read from that but now there are online websites available where you can access almost all types of global literature you don't have to go to the book store and buy the book so the thing that is not even released in india i can read here and that means uh, uh, an arabic or an iranian or scandinavian writer is available to me provided i know the language or i get the translation of it there are hundreds and thousands of followers of k pop here in vadodara i i teach in journalism and i know that majority of my students follow k pop and they don't know korean language but then there is this huge fan following for these people they don't know them they don't know what's happening in korea but they do consume the content that is created by the k pop people so these things are basically the result of the digital technologies that we are exposed to now. so as a, as a literary person as a teacher or as a person who is working on that we cannot ignore any of those technological uh, changes that is coming to our world. and that is the the trend and it, it also brings in a very different kind of culture we used to talk about high culture and low culture in terms of literature now we have popular culture we have pulp culture and there are things which are popular for a certain amount of time and they are so popular that its creators become millionaires overnight but within 2 years 3 years 5 years the millionaires go like they 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 disappear and nobody talks about their creation so that uh, that is again a kind of uh, what contribution that the digital uh, technology has made Uh, in our life so we how to rethink the very idea of literature the very idea of language and the very idea of culture when we are looking at these issues from this modern digital global perspective so that's all from my side thank you thank you so much sir for your sincere words we're pleased to have you here for the evening can we have ms prabhasha next ms prabhasha mondal good afternoon everyone i am prabhasha mondal assistant professor of english at shardo nidhi centenary college uh, so i would uh, like to thank all the organizers for organizing this wonderful on uh, global trends in english language literature and uh, linguistics and my heartfelt thanks to uh, mr chirag patel for the invitation uh, so uh, i'll be uh, speaking on dalit women's narratives so uh, for that i have uh, prepared a ppt so that you can understand this concept better Let me share my screen. Yes, please continue. Okay. Uh, so the title of my uh, talk is uh, "Autobiographical Memory: Memory as Resistance in Bengali Dalit Women's Night." 
so uh, as i am now in uh, chennai station so you uh, must be hearing some weird signs his pardon for that uh, so this is my first slide in the slide the uh, title of my talk when i was invited to attend the second conference of the pushim bangla dalit sahitya academy that is west bengal dalit literature academy at nilda auditorium bonga on 3rd january 2021 i got excited to see the invitation card on my the conference was organized by the ministry of information and culture government of west bengal that day munwantan bapri who is the eminent bengali dalit writer and the president of west this type academy defined bengali dalit literature as protirodhi sahitya that is literature of resistance uh, so in this uh, talk uh, my aim uh, will be you know to discuss how the concept of memory works as a tool of resistance and shape the narratives of dr pushpa boyrako and kalani thakur chara in the partition bengal so their narrative not only concerns the neglected history of bengal but they also provide overview of the bengali dalit women's literature uh, so according to lucas uh, autobiographical memory is a complex concept i'm not uh, going into details as uh, we're running out of time uh, so this is uh, dr pushpa bairaga uh, she was born on 9th of march 1964 at bolongpur in nodia and she was educated at kalani university in west bengal she joined arakura shubhashwendra college as a lecturer on 1st of july 2005 as a dalit writer she has received shola shingo podo from bangladesh in 2018 she is considered to be a representative writer of the bengali dalit literature she is also a social activist she is the editor of the literary journal shriya with gopal bishar she has done her phd on kubinan and dharai vidrash uh, that was in 2004 interestingly she was the first person who completed her phd in india uh, so when i uh, presented my paper at bakura university i was asked uh, by an australian professor what is the Professor Rajkumar writes the term Dalit is a political term which symbolizes the relatively new identity of a group of people who were earlier known as untouchable. He has said untouchability is a deeply ingrained consequence of the caste system and is an unacceptable and harmful social factor. It was abolished when the Indian Constitution came into effect in 1950. In spite of its legal evolution, untouchability continues to be practiced in different forms and degrees in almost all parts of India even today. Thus, the term Dalit clearly suggests that caste and social system is still prevalent in India. In Dalit literature and Dalit identity, A. P. Pulanekar has focused on the emergence of the Dalit Panther, the Mod Movement, the Bhujan Mahasang, and the Bhujan Samaj Party, and others. According to uh, Isp Pulanekar, Dalit writers themselves are either victims or, or witness to social inequities and violence. Some have direct or indirect links with social, political, and cultural organizations of Dalit. Among them are strong social activists and often use literature as a vehicle to propagate their view on Dalit identity and the prevailing social consciousness. Dalit literature doesn't. Constitute a homogeneous or unified community. There are divergent contents. On twenty first November twenty twenty, Dr. Pushpa Boyrago declared at the first conference of Muslim Bengal Dalit Sahitya Academy held at Shishi Mantra, Kolkata. I quote: "We are Dalits. We are oppressed. Dalits are oppressed due to their caste identity." So, Dr. Pushpa Boyrago is a feminine Dalit poet. Who is the Noma Kibro woman from Bengal? In 2005, she was invited to recite her poems at Rajbhavan. At the time, the governor was Gopal Krishna Gandhi. 
Push for Bhairagur recited two poems there. One of her poems is Nari Prakriti, which has been admired by the famous Bengali poet, Nirendranath Chakraborty, who is now no more. Her, another famous poem, Pani Grohan, attempts to criticize the patriarchal values of a society where women are commodified in the marriage market. So realizing the need to mention the neglected history of Bengal with Dalit women, Pushpa Bhairagva attempts to move beyond homogenization of Bengali Dalit women's narratives and tries to highlight the troubled history of Bengal for her watches. Family history or family memory is a typical intergenerational memory. Pushpa Bhairagva records her life experiences in Chinnamal Doritra Dalit Puribare Mer Bedeota, that is growing up as a Dalit woman in the poor refugee family. Her narrative suggests that her parents migrated to India from Bangladesh. Originally, they were the inhabitants of Kadabilia village that is now in Bangladesh. In the narrative, she recollects her childhood. The year was 1970. My age was five. Anarchy had already begun in the East and West. So uh, this uh, narrative was actually written in Bengali and I have translated her narrative in Beng uh, from Bengali to English. So this lines encourage her readers to think that she has gone through the intergenerational trauma. Many Hindu women were raped by the Raja curse and most of the raped women were from the Dalit community. So this incident uh, have not found any place in the history textbooks. Uh, so in this slide, you can see uh, Pushpa Bhairagas uh, Hori Bhutta Temple at Dharampur. Uh, in this slide, you can see the uh, picture of uh, famous book, Sri Sri Hori Lilangu. So now I would uh, like to turn my attention to Pushpa Bhairagas association with the Mutua movement. Pushpa Bhairaga, uh, submitted herself to the cause of the welfare of the Mutuas. She echoed Hurichat uh, Thakur's teachings in her narratives. One cannot deny Hurichat Thakur's contribution to the Mutua Shamaj in Bengal. When I took uh, Boyraga's interview, she commented, I am Mutua and I'm proud of my identity. Mutua is a religion where you can practice spirituality anytime. You don't need to be a Shonashi. For that, we worship Hurichat Thakur, Shantimata Devi, uh, Gurichat Thakur, Shotko Bhama Devi. In my village, Dharam Purui observed the Mutua Mahot shop in February every year. Regarding the concept of Mutuaism, she said, Mutuaism is a philosophy which believes in equality. A Muslim can be a Mutua. This religion believes in humanity. This is the uniqueness of Mutua religion. Uh, so this is uh, Kulani Chakur, who is a Dalit writer and activist. Kulani Chakur Charal achieved popularity with her autobiography, Ami Keno Charal Liki, Why I Write Charal, which was uh, published on uh, 16th of August, 2016. Uh, so it is worth uh, remarking that 16th August is observed as the Kuni Kotal Day by the Dalit people in Bengal. As Kuni Kotal was a tribal girl from Loga community, who was a, a victim of the caste system in Midnapur. So she was repeatedly abused by the Brahmin professor, uh, Falguni Chakraborty at Gita Shagor University. Uh, Professor Chakraborty, along with the other faculty members of Gita Shagor University, instigated Tuni Kotal to commit suicide. In protest, uh, Tuni Kotal writes, I quote, the blood of Lodha, raging bad and felt, all round sound, yet let they be killed. So, in an interview with Kashi uh, Chaudhuri, Polani Chakur Charal observes, Dalit literature is the literature of self respect and pride. So uh, in this slide, you can see a picture. Uh, so this is the um, Chakur's uh, favorite place. This is called Bill. So the Bill uh, acts as a memory metaphor, which has inspired uh, Kalain Chakur to write more on the local history. In the month of Choitro, they sang, O oh, queen of clouds, watch the leaves with your shower. The leaves sing, now tell the sing. 
a land has four corners. So it is interesting to note here that this ritual is basically observed by the Mamushudra women. In Kalana Thakur Charles narrative, we find a test of rich Mamushudra culture. Uh, so uh, it's very important to note what uh, Kalani Thakur uh, herself uh, said. She said, I quote, I would like to call myself the Lip Humanist. Uh, so this uh, discussion uh, may conclude with uh, Munju Bala's famous poem, Baird, where she writes, I quote, Come, you people of the soil, break free from oppression and turmoil. Hit your iron resolution in the embers of the fire that glows fiercely in your heart. So what is really worth noting is that the concept of memory plays a crucial role as a tool of resistance in both Kusubaira Gwen Kalani Taku's uh, Charles narratives. Uh, what you need to understand is that this narrative can be seen as beauty and healing narratives. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Can we have a next speaker, please? Do we have Ms. Abdul Rahim Bodrabain here? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here again. I'm really grateful to Research Culture Society. And uh, I think uh, for me, it's a wonderful uh, experience again. And uh, well, I think we have learned a lot of things. Thank you. I, I can't. <laughs> okay, please continue. Uh, I'd like to, to, to speak like this. Okay, I can share the video now. Okay. Uh, hello again. I'd like to thank uh, the staff of the Research Culture Society and the Department of English Mila University Centers, all the organizers, committee members, and uh, moderators, uh, keynote speakers. Uh, chairpersons uh, and the whole staff here uh, for organizing this uh, very important international conference. Uh, special thanks go to the participants who presented very interesting communications in various fields, uh, including language uh, teaching, literature, and linguistics. And we hope uh, to meet again and again in these uh, conferences. Thank you very much for your attention. That's all. Yes, thank you. Thank you so you. much, ma'am. And as we move towards the end of the evening, I would like to thank all of you for your time and your efforts to this conference, all the presenters, the organizers. Yes, before that, uh, we would like to announce so the best presenters. Here. Yes, yes, so we would like to announce the best presenters. Yes, yes, actually, um, Dr. Bandana. Since the uh, uh, title was different, the title of Dr. Bandana Singh's presentation was Societal Politics and Paradigms of Class, Race, and Gender. And Congratulations to all the presenters who won certificates today. And we would like everyone who presented today to uh, join us in our future events. And thank you so much for your time to our keynote speakers, to our Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, please. And it is in request that all of you to, uh, the link of the form has been given. You have to fill the feedback form and please do join us for future events. We'll be eagerly waiting for you.
So has sent the link. Please do fill the form and let us know how the event went. And thank you so much for joining today. Thank for joining. So can they leave the meeting now? Yes, please. You may all leave the meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Director, sir.